So Bitcoin is really because I, I studied both computer science and economics and statistics and a few other areas, and law. These were mm. tightly guarded secrets, and why so secretive? Uh, knowledge is power. You think history truly does repeat itself? No, I think it's like Mark Twain said, it sure doesn't repeat, uh, sorry, it, it, but it um, sure, certainly rhymes. I think Newton was actually right and, and Einstein was wrong, just that the mathematics available to Newton weren't adequate. Hello, Craig Wright. Wow, what a pleasure to see you again. It's uh, It's been a while since April when we were in Egypt together. I was just mm -hmm. thinking the last time I saw you, we were in a tent, a party tent on the outside perimeter of the uh, Step Pyramid having a blast and listening to you sing, in fact, uh, which probably a lot of our viewers don't know that you've got quite a decent voice. Uh, I heard it many times uh, in, in not only... Uh, giving us philosophical and, and sort of basic wisdom uh, related to the cryptocurrency world and, and particularly Bitcoin, et cetera, mm -hmm. but, uh, but also just on life in general. And you have such an amazing background that is so diversified. You truly are a polymath. And that, mm -hmm. I think, is a rarity in today's world. And it's, uh, it's a pleasure to have you here with us. And for those of you that don't know, um, Craig Wright has played a pivotal role in so much of the way we look at finance today uh, and where it's evolving towards as well uh, with seminal work. And, and nobody nobody can deny the very, very uh, existential role that he has personally played in the early, early days of what we now know as sort of a Bitcoin phenomenon. And it's great to have you here with me, Craig. And uh, I consider you a friend. And it was great to get to know you, not just about the whole aspects of, you know, what happened in the early days of Bitcoin, but also just to get to know you as a person, because you have a deep background. And I was stunned to learn when I first met you as well, uh, how interested you are in history. And mm. I was thinking that might be one of the places I'd like to start with, because you definitely are a student of history. As I remember, I think you're getting another degree right now. You have several. Uh, you have mm. uh, doctorate degrees, et cetera across many different fields, but you're also interested in getting another degree in Hellenistic period, I think ancient Greek uh, history, uh, in, as I recall. In particular, I'm looking at um, the um, Roman region, um, although I'm, I'm also doing um, the Hellenistic area, I'm doing population studies and demographics um, of Rome and looking at the collapse of Rome. So, um, in particular, that's kind looking of foreboding. between third to fourth century. Yes, um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I, it, I I have a big interest in um, ancient economics. I know it's a weird sort of um, side area, uh, but I, I sort of well, as an Aspie, you always have some sort of focus, and mine happens to be money, not in how much money I get, but the history of money, how money works. Um, studying, understanding it, and all the rest. So I remember also a discussion with you uh, about about that topic and about your father as well. Mm. Uh, and and I, I believe your father was very uh, interested and involved in economics also, wasn't he? Um, and yes, but in a different way. Uh, my father was very much, um, well, he was a, union leader and um, uh, very self-educated, but uh, ended up very different to myself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I remember also asking you about the name Satoshi Nakamoto and mm -hmm. uh, what that meant to you. And that actually that came out of, if I recall correctly, something out of the, was it Tokugawa period of Japanese history? That's correct, where, yes. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that. I'd love to hear your, your view on that and why so, that name resonated so deeply for you. Tomogata Nakamoto was a very early um, economist who in many ways, well, had some of the similar sort of ideals of Adam Smith, um, except um, you might say that, I mean, he basically got sick all of a sudden and um, and died when he um, annoyed the uh, shogun 
as happens. I mean, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, so he stopped writing, but um, he was also a polymath. He he was there because he was an economist in um, uh, the Meiji, uh, pre-Meiji period Japan. And people don't realize just how much um, sort of economic uh, growth happened at that time. If you can imagine now with the control of Japan moving to the shogunate and mm -hmm. the rice all coming into Kyoto and then being redistributed. Not ideal, but what it did mean is that the entire um, sort of understanding of the Japanese province then had to be accounted for. Uh, there are lots of records um, that can be analyzed in this. Uh, and then it had to be redistributed. Like Versailles um, in France, then the government created a scenario where all of the nobles had to come in every year to um, uh, sort of meet with the Tokugawa emperor. And this created a way of controlling um, how society functioned. Now, in doing this, what eventuated was many of the parts of Japanese culture we see today, things like sushi and katsukari. Um, these are all fast food. I mean, so people would come out from the provinces, they would have their meetings, and they would enjoy a bit of opera, Japanese opera, and, um, and shows, uh, etc. In, in Tokyo, and then go back. So the whole nature of Japanese culture really transformed over this uh, short period of a few hundred years. And at the same time, um, if you can imagine modeling without computers, um, the nature of how you move grain back and forth around the economy. Um, and in Okunara, they, they, they collected all the records, which is a great source of, of evidence for history in that country, and then redistributed around the country um, based on it's how much It's incredibly organized. It. Incredibly oh, organized. Amazingly. And, and, and I remember reading a book a long time ago by James Clavell, like probably in the 90s, mm. and it was the Shogun series of books, mm. right? And I read a book called Gaijin that he wrote, and I was fascinated that there were probably 50 pages of that book just dedicated to explaining exactly mm. what you're talking about of what it was like to live in, in this very uh, insular society mm. of Japan, which had, you know, had a lot of trading prior to this. And then during the Tokugawa period, it really kind of locked themselves out from, from much of the rest of the world. There was still Dutch trading happening, mm. but each samurai was responsible and paid in one bag of rice right? That would be, be mm. their sustenance for a year, right? The giant bag of rice that they would have that they could mm. eat. That was enough rice to eat for a year. And that was their payment. And, and it would vary to... depending yeah. on, on their rank and um, um, how many retainers they could supply to the emperor, etc. It's fascinating. You know, I, I lived in Japan. I worked in Japan. Mm. I lived there for two years. And I remember the first time I walked into Japanese office, like a work office, um, I noticed that the organizational chart of the entire company was on the floor of the office. So, for example, like, let's say you have an org chart that's got, you know, the CEO up at the top. And mm. then you've got all these people coming off of this org chart. The desks were arranged like this. And the CEO is in the back corner, farthest away from the entry door. Mm. So that if they're attacked, the low man on the totem pole, right, the low man is the first one to get killed. Right. That's basically <laughs> what it is. And so everything is about protecting the shogun, right? Or the mm. daimyo or all these different layers. And I found that fascinating uh, as I lived in Japan and ha having that experience and then studying the Japanese history was so fascinating to me. And then when you mentioned that when we were in Egypt together mm. about. Did about you go economy. through some of the castles there? In, um, oh, I Kyoto? went through all of them. Yeah, I was oh, fascinated I mean, by it. Don't, don't you love how you have to go through this sort of maze to actually get in there? And, and it all has this same mentality mm. behind it, right? So it's like, and, and the funny thing is, both in Japanese culture and in Korean culture, mm. the women had all the power inside the castle, inside the house. Mm. But outside, in the outside world, it was the man who had more of the outward power. But as soon as he got inside the house, 
he was, you know, as they would say in both Japanese and Korean, henpecked and, <laughs> and sort of controlled by, by the, the feminine. And I found all of that very, very fascinating. And it very much ties into the yin yang principles mm. that are so prevalent in Eastern philosophy today. And, mm. you know, I guess with all this study of history you've done, at least for myself, when I look at history, I like to read history because I believe it's the best mm. way for us to be able to ascertain patterns that will continue to impact us today. So mm. that we, you know, the best indicator of the future is probably historical reference, right? Mm. It doesn't always come out that way, but we can certainly tie back to certain patterns. So is that why maybe you're, you're take, turning your focus and attention to the fall of Rome? Uh, in part, um, but it's also um, understanding society and what makes it tick, what um, what we can do to actually make sure that this doesn't fall. Um, have you read the tale of Gunji? Yes, I have. It's been a, it's been a while mm. though. Yes, I mean, um, uh, little quote. I should like to indulge in the pleasures of the seasons, the blossoms, the autumn leaves, the changing skies, and that really reflects a lot of Japanese culture as I see it. I mean, um, I've been there in Japan and Tokyo a few times during um, uh, Sakura Cherry Blossom Festival. And uh, that's the the, around the April time frame for those of you that yeah. don't know. Every it year, around every that year. time, you have these beautiful cherry blossom trees that have these wonderful pink flowers. Mm. And, and they all, they're all they're all genetically gorgeous. related, so they all flower at exactly the same time. It, it, it's within two weeks. Like two mm. weeks, the whole city is full of flowers. It's beautiful. Mm. And not and, just and, city, and, but and, and it's more than that. It's a whole, as they open, seeing the flower, and then as the petals come down and cover the ground, it's the whole ceremony and not just looking at life as um, many of us in the West now do, uh, as a something that's gone past, but reflecting on on what we are. That's so fascinating. So w when you came up with this name, Satoshi Nakamoto, you were really thinking about this economist in in Tokugawa, you know, Meiji period Japan, which is well, fascinating. I mean, I grew up with a lot of the culture. My grandfather. Um, had my, my one of my few, and I've got very few regrets, was that I didn't um, learn Italian. My grandfather spoke perfect um, Italian with uh, uh, basically a Tuscan sort of dialect, and that enabled him to spend a lot of time in Japan. He worked on purple and was um, um, actually in um, sort of uh, over in Betchley Park for part, but he uh, went with MacArthur into the Philippines, mm -hmm. uh, pretending to be a, um, a an Italian officer, because as you might guess, no one cared about the Italians. The Japanese just thought he was like here to learn and just ignored him. Um, so while he was aiding the um, the people in the Philippines to build radio towers and send messages. Um, because he he studied under Maconi after um, in um, Italy and um, um, under Marconi he learnt um, sort of the directly um, concept of wireless communications and wow um, um, so he his masters uh, my uncle was very high up in uh, in the Australian military and uh, neither of us have actually gotten his um, uh, dissertation yet because some of the foundations still form basically the foundation of the over the horizon radar and the radio system in Australia for his work so it's still classified even though he's dead hmm. um, which is really annoying um, he wrote it 35 36 um, long long time ago he's he's um, he passed away a number of years ago but um, you'd think um, something written in the 30s would be declassified by now, but it's not. Very interesting. That's it's a fascinating thing. So, mm. so as you go back to the topic of history, 
where do you see we are in that cycle? You know, one of my favorite books, and I'm sure you've read it, uh, is Plato's Republic. Mm. And um, as, as you kind of read through that book, it's pretty amazing to see that somebody, you know, all the way back in the fourth century BC was thinking about all the different stages of government and governance mm. that we cycle through. And sometimes, you know, we're too close to the tree to see the forest. So we can't see the fact that we're just in a cycle. And it's probably a pattern that's repetitive. Many it's repeated many, many times in the past. So where do you see we are right now in the world based on all of your historical reference as we kind of, you know, maybe use Plato as a reference or well, other other references that you can, well, we, you can we, bring Well, we tried to create um, republics. Mm -hmm. And republics are very different to um, um, democracy, although we mm -hmm. say that term. And Madison in Federalist Paper Number 10 explained brilliantly the reason why society doesn't want a pure democracy and why protecting the minority in society is so critical. Now, through that process, we have moved away, slowly eroding the rights of the minority in seeking what we, we call a democracy. And as we get more and more towards what we now call democracy, we're actually getting to the point where we are undermining the very Western culture that we have created. Now, in what I'm saying there, we are allowing large business, um, what Adam Smith um, argued in multiple points, uh, I tweeted about this today, um, to be sort of the business people who undermine society. Um, we seem to think that the market must always be right, but Smith pointed out that the um, unseen hand is generally correct but needs to be guided. And that's, that's something people forget. And as we're going through and uh, analyzing uh, what you're talking about with democracy and society, we're moving towards a demagoguery. And we've seen that more and more. Hmm. And having read Plato, of course, in the Republic, you know what demagoguery leads to. Oh, yeah. Well, and it's, it's, it's not far from mob rule. Right. Exactly. And the and, problem with mob rule is tyranny. Yeah. And tyranny follows and tyranny is not something good. We saw, I mean, um, I'm not going to necessarily blame Trump for this, but he should have actually stood up and said more. Uh, but the raid on, on the Capitol house, um, uh, on Congress, that was mob. And we mm -hmm. shouldn't allow the mob to rule. Yeah. No, I, I think, you know, if you go back in history, another place I like to look at, which was a time of extreme turmoil, would have been France mm. in the reign of terror mm. in 1789. Well, that was, that was a pure democracy. Mm -hmm. And um, remember, of course, the reason that Plato started writing. It was because Socrates was executed. And people yeah. will argue with me, and they have, going, he wasn't technically executed. He committed suicide. Well, well yeah. I mean, <laughs> he didn't have much choice in it. That was the thing. He, I mean, let's see. A, you could either suicide and do it that way, or we could do a state-based execution, which is far worse. It's such a crazy story, that story about Socrates. I'm glad you raise it, because I think, you know, for those that don't know this, and, and not everyone's doing a master's in in Hellenistic period Greece or, you know, Etruscan and Roman, mm. uh, you know, influence on society today. But that story was fascinating. But they should. Um, because, but, well, I mean, I'll, I'll just interrupt that you because, avoid... um, well, look, I actually think uh, there's a move in the United States to move back to the trivicum and quadrivicum and um, start teaching, uh, including uh, some of the old Western culture and, and books in Latin and Greek. Uh, I, I mean, um, I can do a little bit of, of Latin, although my, um, my teachers at, at uh, Birmingham said that I'm very loose with my Latin because um, I, I never remember which gender an item is supposed to be. I mean, honestly, 
it's a table. I don't really care whether it's male or female. It's a goddamn it's table. It's female. Anyway. I'll, I'll tell um, you it's female in Latin. Because mm. it would be it must be because in French it's it's female. La table, mm. right? Um yeah. you, you basically or, or or actually no it'd be it'd be male. Sur le table. Sur le table. Yeah, it's the mm. it's 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 male. But but the, but the Germans have it completely reversed and go somewhere different. Oh, yeah. Well, they have a neuter. They have the dear das, right? So it's das auto instead of die mm. auto or der auto. Der would be, would be masculine. But the reason I raised this topic of, of Socrates, I think it's a great mm. story because I don't remember the name of the general. You'll probably remember. But the, the Greek uh, Navy and Army was coming back from battles, I think, in the Hellenistic Wars. And, mm. and there was a terrible uh, storm that happened, and, mm. and some of the people fell out of the ship as they were coming back. You may rem mm -hmm. remember the story. They fell out of the ship coming back to Greece, and, and they, the, the general was held to account as to why they didn't go back and, and save these people when they fell out of the, the ship on the mm. way home. And, um, and Socrates was one of the only voices. It became kind of a mob kind of a situation, even in the Senate. And Socrates was one of the only voices that, that actually stood up for the general and said, look, sometimes you have to sacrifice, uh, you know, a few to benefit mm. the many. And, mm -hmm. and in the storm, you know, it's easy to play Monday morning quarterback and to say, this is what you should have, could have, or would have done. Mm. But when you're actually in the situation and you have to make a decision, as a leader, you know, you, you sometimes are faced with tough decisions mm. like this. And, and so because he was one of the only voices that stood up for this general, that clearly there was other mm. political undertones going on, uh, they sentenced him, you know, to, to death effectively mm. and told him that he had to commit suicide by drinking hemlock, which is, you know, it's basically like drinking, it's a drinking a poison that acts like a neurotoxin. It shuts off your body slowly. It's a terrible way to mm. die. And, and Plato, of course, was one of the protégés of, uh, of Socrates. And so he watched mm. Socrates, this great man who gave us these two words of know thyself, which is probably mm. sounds like the easiest thing in the world you could do. But actually, it's probably the most difficult thing we will ever do. Mm. It's very, very deep. And, you know, he ended up having to, to die this ignominious death mm. in a jail cell. Uh, which was a terrible story. And that became the impetus behind Plato starting to publish and write. So mm -hmm. to, to the point you're making, I think it's a fascinating story where someone stood up for someone else, but because demagoguery took old, over. Mm. And, and that's exactly the point you're making. It was like cancel culture, right? And well, very much so. Um, so I believe you're talking about Alcibiades. Mm -hmm. um, yes. The, um, and the Peloponnesian War. Mm -hmm. And um, um, I think it was uh, outside, of, just after the siege of um, um, Byzantium. See, I knew you would know these details. That's why you're getting a master's in this. Mm -hmm. I, it was 40 years ago when I read it, but it stuck mm -hmm. with me today. Yeah, he actually um, um, uh, defected to Sparta at one stage, but uh, had to piss off your um, country. But then they didn't treat him terribly well at other times anyway, so... Yeah, I mean, it's, this it's is the whole thing. If you uh, um, if you um, sort of uh, sort of bring charges, and I mean, Socrates was remarkably honourable. I mean, not many people will have people go. Look, you can leave the city and go into exile, and we'll um, make sure that you live. Who would actually go? Well, I'm sorry, but I'm Athenian, and being Athenian is the most important thing in my life. So. I'm not going to leave. So do you think history truly does repeat itself? No, I think it's like Mark Twain said, it sure doesn't repeat. I'm uh, sorry, it, but it um, sure, certainly rhymes. It certainly rhymes. That's a good way to yes. put it. That's a good mm. way to put it. So, yeah. we're, so you, were, you were saying, though, that we, we run this risk in today's society, that mm -hmm. we could go into this same demagoguery Right. Which oh, I think along with it comes, you know, sort of culture wars, cancel mm. culture. Uh, this looks a lot and feels a lot like the period in China, uh, you know, where they would have this thing called the literati purges, mm. where, you know, you would sort of eviscerate people that were of counter narrative, especially in the educated ranks. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm 
drawn to what's happening right now with uh, with Jordan Peterson and and how, you know, he's been stripped of his of his license now. Mm. Um, is this the kind of demagoguery that you're talking about? Or are you referencing something altogether different? Oh, very much so. Um, a lot of this actually goes back to educational changes by um, um, uh, Fernando Ferez, uh, terrible pronunciation because it's um, um, Portuguese, um, who was a Brazilian um, uh, educational scholar, pedagogist in the 70s. And he brought in a lot of Marxist concepts. So most parents don't even realize, I mean, I've been um, involved with studying education for a little while now, and um, I've just recently finished my um, master's degree in education over at, um, uh, over here in the UK, uh, where I had the uh, honor of um, interviewing a whole lot of different um, head teachers and things like that around the country during COVID. Uh, it was the wow. fun process of actually having to arrange things during COVID, uh, but, um, and, and want to continue that um, into my, my doctor of education. But part of the problem is um, how people don't even realize how we've hijacked education. So in this bringing in discussions and trying to get kids to discuss things, we'll do things like um, bringing in a math question and and um, you look at the um, the textbook and 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 parents won't even realize this now, but their children will have a Marxist discussion about culture. So it'll be something like um, Johnny's father took him to the park on the weekend. The park is eight kilometers away. He had to go to um, meet his mother uh, three kilometers away. How far did Johnny have to go to get home? And little things like this. And then the teacher can bring up um, on this argument something like, so Johnny's father, do you think he lives with his mother? <laughs> what if Johnny um, had two fathers? How do you think about that? Um, all those sort of questions. So it, it really brings things into um, uh, scope that are way outside of, of mathematics, for instance. And this is why so many children are not doing their math lessons and failing. Now, if you imagine this in primary school, okay, like, like... Well, that's the thing now. It's part of the cancel culture, right? I mean, mm. math is racist now because everything is racist. And, and Oh, of uh, course. Um, I mean, after all, I mean, we ignore the fact that the Egyptians um, sort of started many of the concepts that Pythagoras took over and that they led into changes in um, uh, Indian culture that led to Arabic culture that led to Western culture, dot, dot, dot. And we yeah, just go, oh, say, it's I all the West. The white population was probably last to really understand math. Um, I mean, one of the last, obviously we had some notable exceptions with with uh, Isaac Newton, et cetera, who would probably be considered one of the great mathematicians of all time. Mm. But, you know, regardless, you're right. It was the Egyptian mystery schools that taught mm. pretty much all of the Greek polymaths and philosophers, all the mathematics and the the geometry that they learned anew. And then they became the mechanism for the promulgation of that geometry understanding to the rest of the world. And so well, we have records of that. And that's why we... we the irony it. here we, isn't... Um, uh, quite as people think. It's that um, some silly buggers in England decided to start publishing it all. Yes. Uh, people don't realize that things like um, solving quadratic equations were actually well known um, even a thousand years before they became common in Europe. The issue was you had to do an apprenticeship and join a mystic society, and then you were um, sort of expelled under penalty of of death if you talked about these things yeah you could even um, say certain words right that was the whole yeah. thing about the pythagorean so um so even in, if you go back to greece and rome so many of the architects who did these remarkable um domes that we even find difficult to think of like how the pantheon we, in rome pantheon yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um you you think about the mathematics behind that, and the reason we don't have it is no one wrote it down. 
So it was there, but you had to be trained in it. And part of your training was you swore yourself to secrecy, knowing that uh, you faced um, sort of persecution from the other members of the sort of uh, group if you ever said anything. Isn't that, that kind of one of the promises? Control. Isn't that one of the possible use cases for blockchain, though? Well, so that we can have a recorded history? Oh, definitely. Uh, this is one of the um, the aspects of, of European Renaissance that were very interesting as people started uh, taking uh, texts that they conquered in um, uh, during during warfare and translating them and disseminating them around Europe. Many aspects of um, sort of earlier knowledge suddenly became common. Have you studied the uh, the clay tablet? the Sumerian clay tablet called Plimpton 322, which is a clay tablet that clearly shows that more than a thousand years prior to Pythagoras, the Sumerians were doing advanced trigonometry and, and obviously using what we now know as the Pythagorean theorem uh, many, many times over. And it was all outlined on this one clay tablet. Have you, have you seen this? Actually, it came um, out of Macquarie University, uh, mm -hmm. the research around it. It was pretty fascinating. Yeah, I haven't actually seen it myself, but I do know of it. Um, but it just goes to my point, uh, which is mathematicians were basically um, closed, well, guild groups or pre-guilds. I mean, beyond um, sort of that part of history, but the equivalent, these individuals who knew knowledge, but wouldn't disseminate it. And, and why do you think that was? I mean, I have my own theories on it, but I'd love to hear yours. As to um, why, why it was, they it was all part of these gilded societies and very much secretive, almost like, you know, Freemasonic, the knowledge of the geometry, like Pythagoras kept it very, very quiet. You know, it was punishable by death to say even the wrong words um, and uh, that related to, you know, irrationality, et cetera. These were mm. tightly guarded secrets. And why so secretive? Uh, knowledge is power. So if you control the access to it, you keep it scarce. Um, no, very few people are going to sort of have the intellect to create mathematics from base principles. Um, discovering all of this from scratch is, is going to be rare. Occasionally it does happen, but um, very, very rare. I mean, Roman Duchin and a few people like that just have natural skills. Uh, but um, for the majority of individuals, you basically need to learn from someone else. So um, most of these people in, in a society would have to, to learn. And the origin of the word liberal that people don't understand, um, going back into sort of pre-medieval, was freedom from labor. It wasn't like we see liberalism now. It was uh, someone who had learnt the skills to be able to work uh, in a way that didn't involve having to do physical labour. Hmm. So you got paid more, you had a better life. Um, we look at um, um, and, and analyse uh, scribes and say how little they got paid. But compared to someone who was um, a builder or a day labourer, they were remarkably um, sort of high up in society. And sitting there going, they got far less than a king. Well, yeah, practically everyone got far less than a king. That's the whole point. There's only one king. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is true. This is true. You mentioned Ramanujan. Mm. So Ramanujan is, is someone that I've spent quite a bit of time studying his work. And what are your thoughts on his perspective that, you know, he was getting his sort of downloads, I guess, or accessing a field, you know, like many Vedic mathematicians, you referenced, you know, uh, mm. a lot of advanced mathematics going into mm -hmm. India. I totally agree with that. Uh, but many of these people that are able to discover mathematics, mm -hmm. uh, like Ramanujan, claim that, you know, their experience is a flash of inspiration that they believe has its emanation from divine source. And, and so I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on that. Um, I don't necessarily disagree. Um, I mean, I 
uh, wrote an OA, an um, idea that will go to a patent today, and um, uh, we're seeking to push it forward because we want to get it published in a major source like Nature or something like this. Um, but the concept wasn't something that I sat there uh, putting effort into. It just one of these things that I'm sitting uh, enjoying um, sort of writing about something else and thought about it and it just came to me and like many other aspects of what I've created, it just happens. And um, you can argue how you want that it's um, sort of unusual wiring in the brain or any other excuse that um, you can use. But I mean, I happen to be a theologian as well. So um, I'm not going to argue that. Yes, yeah, so and I want to come back to that too, if we can. Mm. I want to come back to the theologian aspect of who mm. you are, because I could almost do a whole podcast series on the many facets of Craig Wright, for sure. Mm. Um, but, you know, for myself, I, I, I don't hold as many patents as you do. You have well over, you know, 1,300 patents, which most people don't realize. Having that many patents is extremely expensive. <laughs> because the maintenance fees on those patents and just to stay up on their continuations mm -hmm. and everything is a huge effort. Mm -hmm. I have personally about 60 patents now, and I probably file. Mm -hmm. um, I got five new issuances just last month, but it's a major expense. And, you know, first of all, whenever I get patents and they come in, I mm -hmm. feel like I'm almost tapping into a radio signal. Like I have a, I don't feel like the thoughts are just coming straight from my brain or my biology mm -hmm. or that it's all local. And this might explain why I've even ended up in some patent litigations mm -hmm. where a guy in Russia I never met before who never knew me came up with the same idea and filed it the same day that I did, right? Mm -hmm. Or a similar idea. And this was in the photonics field. And I, I was just stunned. How can that be? And the only conclusion I can come to is that maybe what we think of as local to our brains is not necessarily only local to our brains. It might be that it's some burst of information that people that are tuned into that frequency might be able to tie into. I don't exactly know. All I know is that when I talk to creators, people that have these inspirations have prolific number of patents uh, and, and you know are prodigious inventors they almost all universally say the same thing that you're saying to me, uh, mm -hmm. where it's like an inspirational thing and they don't necessarily credit it with just their wit or their own genius. Mm. No, I totally agree. Um, these, these ideas aren't things that I necessarily plan. Um, there are moments where things come in bursts and, can you sit there and make excuses saying that it's uh, some sort of process outside of uh, yourself or inside yourself or anything else? Yes, of course. Uh, if I'm a Richard Dawkins, I'd just go, well, it's just a alignment of um, sort of neurons at a particular time that I'm lucky. And yeah, yeah well, I'm not really into his arguments. So, Yeah, me, me also. I, I definitely yeah. feel like there's something much more significant that connects the universe together. And that leads me to the next question. Now in 1990 mm. or around the, the early nineties, you were actually a pastor. Again, another one of the facets of, of the uh, inimitable <laughs> Craig mm. Wright. So tell us about that. What was your thinking behind becoming a pastor and, and what did you learn from that experience? Oh, uh... I learned a lot of church administration and um, uh, also uh, got to be a trustee of the church bank after a while. Uh, really? Yeah, I think yeah, everyone discovered in the church that I'm much better being away from people. Um, but anyway, <laughs> that's a different matter. Um, I'm not necessarily the um, the best person to, uh, to be a pastor, but um, the theology side of it actually did interest me. Um, but there's not many um, people who want to be an Aquinas anymore and actually analyze books and texts. But anyway. So what was the motivation behind that for you? Um, I wanted to research and understand. So I'd, I'd grown up in a Catholic school and I didn't necessarily agree with all the 
sort of foundations of Catholicism. Um, and after doing a lot of um, research, I, I thought um, uh, sort of the concepts of you know, Protestant religions uh, aligned better with what I believe. Mm -hmm. And so was it, did you always have kind of like a, a search for meaning at an earlier stage of your life, uh, looking at the world or was it something altogether different? Uh, not always. I mean, um, it'd be nice to say that uh, everything was aligned and perfect, but the reality is um, I was a teenage kid at um, and going through school and all the rest. So um, uh, although I had um, friends with um, some of the people at um, like Padua, I, I had uh, Father Ed, um, who passed away quite a number of years ago now, was a very good friend of mine. And I saw him, used to visit him uh, well after I graduated. Um, but um, I think the, the school actually wanted me to look into the priesthood, but it just wasn't for me. <laughs> yeah, I think I felt the same way. Uh, I was at one point Catholic, mm. and I was like, I don't know if I can do this like celibacy thing, to be honest. So yeah. I was like, that's not for me, I don't think. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, definitely I was always someone who I think questioned the nature of existence. And I yeah, wanted to understand it's, it's it more It's always deeply. interesting how um, um, people sort of try and avoid it by... Um, enacting a whole lot of things that make things more complex. I mean, think about multiverse theory. Let's see, a new, uh, every uh, quantum time interval. A for new every universe, decision I make, there's a whole for, new universe? Not just That's... you, but I mean, for everything that may happen, there's a whole new universe. Yeah, it's Where crazy. the hell do these go? I mean, there's, yeah, there's you know, be a... we've never talked about this. What are your views on on the nature of reality and and i don't know you, there was just a nobel prize that was issued uh around entanglement it was fundamental mm. to i'm sure you followed it because it was related to quantum computing as well mm. and i know that's a topic for you of interest and uh basically it states that you know local realism is false um and and so this notion that that um you know if if something is not observed that it may not actually have a position after all um, and a local position being its existence, right? So mm. that means if, if everybody doesn't observe the moon, if nobody observed the moon, does the moon actually exist? Or if a bear, you know, shits in the forest and nobody saw and experienced it and, and mm. realized it, did it even really happen? What are your thoughts on this? And, oh. you know, and then multiverses, I think is a totally different topic. Yeah. But um, related, the same sort of thing. But related. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think it's complete quackery. Um, so I did a, a dissertation on philosophy um, last year, looking at time, which is an area I want to continue with. But um, um, I think Newton was actually right and, and Einstein was wrong, just that the mathematics available to Newton weren't adequate. So um, I believe that there is absolute time, but the um, nature of how we measure, um, we need to actually start calculating across Hilbert space and um, uh, each sort of element of what we see will then be um, uh, vary depending on sort of the quantum uh, gravity at any point. So um, I think part of the problem with these other areas is that they're um, deciding to ignore reality and finding ways of ignoring it, which actually doesn't um, provide empirical results. Um, I mean, uh, back when um, um, the Higgs particle was uh, proposed was about the last time that we had a uh, result that is empirically able to be validated. So we have all this theoretical physics now that is complete hogwash. Uh, and I'll say that because in 50 years, we've not had anything that is validatable out of all of these um, areas. Um, supersymmetry is uh, problematic in that um, uh, if we start thinking about it for a moment, um, there's nothing beyond Higgs. We keep moving the goalposts and going, we must find something eventually. 
all you need to do is spend another four billion, five billion dollars building a bigger <laughs> collider, and eventually yeah, we, it'll we be there. We need a thirty-four kilometer <laughs> collider now. <laughs> I yeah. know. Um, so, yeah, my uh, my my ideas of quantum are rather uh, well. What would have been mainstream once and now are no longer mainstream. Okay. Hmm. So if it's good looking good, then we can keep going forward. So, so this is fascinating um, because when you, mm. when you kind of look at what's happening in the world of physics today, you know, that's mm. the thing, that's my beef, I think, with theoretical physics is that mm. they keep theorizing things that could never be tested in their lifetimes. And then, <laughs> well, it's not even whether they can be tested in their lifetime, it's whether they can be tested full stop. Yeah. And some of these things can't. Um, when you get into multiverse theory, et cetera, it's not even physics. It's metaphysics and an excuse to say, well, we don't need to have religion because there's just another universe. Mm -hmm. And um, it goes down to Feynman's um, argument with a um, um, uh, Hindu woman, which is there's turtles all the way down. I mean, once you start creating that in physics, you've lost physics. It, when When you say, well, where did the universe start? Well, there was another universe. Where did that start? There was another universe. And you just go, <laughs> there's universes all the way down. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sorry. Um, except that uh, this might be it. And unless you can prove otherwise, then popping up universes um, 10 to the 49 times a second is a bit ridiculous. But But so... I think that the part that is valuable to me when I look at uh, the notion of quantum mm. physics is the nature of the observer, mm. that the observer, and I think this is why we, <laughs> this is probably why placebo is the greatest drug of all time, right? That treats everything mm. and that observation uh, and the very act of expectation seems through, you know, maybe it's through the Hawthorne effect um, seems to impact the the outcome of the thing being observed mm. in some way shape or form so what are your thoughts on that well that's interesting but i think it just shows our lack of understanding and knowledge to say the truth um what are we doing that impacts it now the, it comes back to the argument and that we have no known way of knowing how anything could impact the universe from outside the universe but then at the same time, many of the people who argue that um, also argue a holographic universe, which mm -hmm. could be an information universe, including something that is a super complex beyond our, our Ken uh, idea of a computer running a simulation. Mm -hmm. Now, outside a computer, I can interact with the code without having any input. Mm -hmm. So if I, I skip to between these things and go, well, you can't have any input that we can't measure, um, but it could be a holographic universe. Well, then you inter introduce uh, methodologies for um, introducing external information anyway. So if you, you think about it for a moment, mm -hmm. um, so your, your own argument um, sort of ends the argument in that um, – if we have a holographic universe and nothing can be measured outside of that universe, that only applies to us. It doesn't apply to anything outside the universe because right. if something's outside the holographic universe, well, it can write things on the side of the damn universe and change things. And, and suddenly your hair could appear gray or green or eh, not saying that it will, but there's no reason why it can't. So do you believe, I mean, are you uh, someone who believes more in this holographic principle for the universe? Um, I believe in an information-centered universe, and I believe um, in quantum in that I don't believe in infinities, either um, negative or positive ones. There's not infinitely small or infinitely large, in my opinion. Uh, so that always takes us back to... Um, um, single value like um, numbers not not something like pi that goes on forever mm -hmm. um, even though we have pi and we can't calculate it but it, it takes us into some sort of calculation that uh, must always be um, in effect binary in nature um, that doesn't mean that we are in a 
computer universe, but it does mean that um, there's a whole lot of stuff we don't understand. So if we were in a computer universe, could you imagine that something would be outside of that universe? I mean, oh, in, definitely, of course. In, it must I mean, be, I, right? I mean, our simplified idea of something like the the matrix or um, uh, any of these other concepts of sort of a, um, a universe within a computer system are oversimplified. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, may, who knows? Maybe you and I are somewhere in some vat of jello, right? <laughs> uh, suspended, you know, while we're actually wearing some sort of goggles or something that, that have mm. us in this, uh, you know, matrix of mind universe to learn and experience. And, and I actually, I actually can, can really contemplate that that is not as foreign as it might sound. Um, mm. Because when we start looking at the principles of how the universe works and physics and everything else. Um, and, and I was just, you know, sort of toying with this notion of strong force uh, versus mm. weak force and, and the differential and, and found a, a small potential mm. solution to this problem is just being that there might actually be another complex plane of numbers that, that governs, 10, uh, the square root of 10 to the power of negative one and smaller sizes and the square root of 10 to the power of one to larger sizes. So it creates literally this, you know, this mirror of consciousness. And when you do that, then all of a sudden gravity goes from being a very weak force in the macro world to at the subatomic scale become a very, very powerful force. And, and electromagnetism, which is strong in the macro mm -hmm. sense, is very, very weak um, in the subatomic world. And, and, you know, I started to uh, write this as a paper recently because I, I do fundamentally believe that there is a holographic principle at work and that that principle is around the, the number one and that there's a mirror mm -hmm. of, of consciousness at that number one. And then each one of us, you could say, is split or dividing the number one. And we have a, a pattern of periodicity in our mm. lives that, that create this sort of like repetition until we finally realize it. Mm. And so there, there's an argument that says that maybe we do live in some sort of holographic simulation. Um, I'm not putting it forward as definitive mm. fact, but uh, I'm also not discounting it as a possibility. The way I'd put it would be that's just far too simple. As opposed to far too complex, so maybe you're saying the far too complex would be the multiverse and there's a different universe for mm. every possible outcome and every possible choice that could be mm -hmm. made, which seems crazy complex because I think that, uh, you know, I believe Leonardo da Vinci's, uh, uh, you know, way of putting this, which is that uh, simplicity is the mm. ultimate sophistication. And it's actually and do, very difficult to be simple as well. It's very difficult. So that's why I think if, if God really is a, a master architect and geometer, mm. and then I think he would find the most beautiful, simplistic way to, mm. to actually represent and, and probably encrypt it for himself. But I, you know, these are things Which that you cannot is know. Of one of the core problems, I think right now where we're going in society, the, the move towards um, brutalism and architecture, the abandonment of aesthetics, uh, the whole notion of postmodern abandonment of anything beautiful is, um, yeah. Oh, well, I remember why I used to live in Germany too, Craig, and mm. uh, I lived in a town called Wiesbaden, which I chose mm -hmm. because it was one of the few cities that was not destroyed in World War II. Mm. Mm -hmm. And so you have two kinds of cities in, in Germany. You have cities that are either beautiful architecture, like in Wiesbaden, that, mm. that survived, right? Like Regensburg, you know, Garmisch. There's a lot of places in Bavaria that are like that as well. And then most of the place kind of looks a lot like uh, Frankfurt, mm. which, you know, you've got a bunch of buildings. There's some notable exceptions, you know, like mm. the Bahnhof, or the tra where the train station is, and the the core house and the you know, mm. casino, et cetera. But most of it looks like these buildings that were the postmodern period, mm. just like cement boxes that, yeah. uh, that were all about utilitarianism. Uh, brutalism. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I brutalism mean, and no form, unlike Paris. You know, the, luckily the Germans mm. didn't destroy Paris when they occupied it. And Paris has these incredibly beautiful boulevards and architecture that that speaks to form, maybe arguably even above function sometimes. Mm. Right. And we love France for that. But uh, well, I think finding Dennis Bain and, 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 and then true. you've got Gaudi. Yeah, well, I do like that because it's such a, you know, that whole city feels like um, like a, a form of surrealism, doesn't it? I mean, mm. I, I I love that aspect of it. You know, at the Gaudi Park, uh, the, mm. the grow in, it's like beautiful stuff. And and this is one of the things I've loved about my life is that I've had the opportunity to visit over 140 countries. And, and that in and of itself has been an education. Mm. So that's sort of leads me back to, you know, your, your passion around education. What do you think we need mm -hmm. to do as a society to oh. really raise the bar on education? Because I, I do feel like the world is unfortunately dumbing so much stuff down. And then cancel culture is, is attacking what's left over. Uh, well, that I'm kind of concerned about where the youth of the world are, are headed right now, to be honest. Well, the big problem is equity always um, sort of goes downwards. So if we're seeking to make people equal, there's only one way. It's equally dumb, equally poor, equally everything else. Um, there's no other way to look at this. I mean, if you think about it, uh, you can't raise people who don't have the skills to be smarter than they are. You can't make people uh, work harder than they naturally want to. Now, mm -hmm. you can to a, a little extent, but you do so at the extent of crushing everyone else. So we need to actually understand that education is not about making everyone equal. It's about taking those people that you can um, and giving them everything they need to be good citizens, to understand culture. Um, now, for instance, I, uh, in my studies in education and um, English in the last few years, um, I, I looked at some of the, the work that people are studying in British English schools. And um, I wrote a blog post on some of the things I, I ended up having to read because of like mirroring what students are doing. And uh, one of those was... Um, um, Wolverine Origins. Mm -hmm. Now, so if you know about the Wolverine movies, there's also, of course, a graphic novel series. Mm -hmm. And um, in English language studies, uh, English, this is looked upon as not just, uh, it's a graphic novel. Now, the way that I would have been brought up would be, it's a comic book. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, the graphic novel is actually. I mean, it, yeah, I like that. It, it, it's it, it's a bit of fun when you're eight, but mm -hmm. I mean, in year twelve, studying um, this as part of like vernacular culture, etc. It's just, I'm I'm sorry, it doesn't actually teach you. It doesn't. <laughs> I mean, yes, um, you get to experience Wolverine um, regenerating and bursting out of Hulk who's gone bad in the end and, and, um, but how is that actually educating people? And you can say that there are lots of weird stories in, in Homer and things like that too. Um, uh, but so what? That, that, it's very different. The, the level of um, literary skill involved with writing a comic book and a major novel or um, sonnet or something like this are very different. And yes, yes there are some weird aspects of Shakespeare too. Um, True. It, I mean, have you seen Titus Andronicus? It, it's yes, one of my I favorite. Have. Yes. Yeah, I mean, and I, by the um, way, I'm a huge fan of Shakespeare. Yeah. Um, I mean, even it's got to be one of his, his um, one wackiest person. plays. Yeah. I don't believe Shakespeare. I believe Shakespeare was actually a pen name. I've done a lot of mm. research on this, working with my colleague, Alan Green, mm. on decrypting the work of Francis Bacon, Edward de Vere, uh, Kit Marlowe, uh, and several other luminaries from the time who were also all involved, including John Dee, in the, the, the translation of the King James Version of the Bible mm. in 1611. And the amount of wisdom that is embedded within the sonnets 
Um, and that's a whole other conversation I'd love to have with you. Mm. The structure of the sonnets actually relates back to the Great Pyramid and the structure of the Great Pyramid. They were they were encoding. They were all Rosicrucian scholars. They were encoding so much information in there about the nature of life and existence. Um, and it's fascinating. The last two sonnets, for example, 153 and 154, are known as the bath sonnets. They're referring to the alchemical bath, the union of masculine and feminine. And, and it's basically chronicling a story. Both sonnets are the same story, just written differently. And they're chronicling the story of Psyche and Eros, right, which mm -hmm. you would remember from, uh, from Greek mm -hmm. mythology. Um, and it's fascinating how much you can find in there. It's just mind boggling. But you're right. I don't think today in That's society, true. I mean, if you just look at the movies mm -hmm. that are coming out, they're all like comic book movies. I don't know how we could reference well, it. But, but it's kind of the same if thing. we go back into history, even um, sort of West Side Story is Romeo and Juliet. So we have all of these stories yeah. that have been rewritten and recreated that we're now forgetting. Now, um, I differ from you. I, I believe Shakespeare was one person. I believe he had the ability. Mm -hmm. The distinction people don't understand is the um, sort of translation of, of um, Petrarch, the lives and um and other works were all coming out at the same time and if you look at shakespeare's um sort of origins um his father was a, a head of a, a grammar school um in, um, uh, in just over avon way and um, he would have had access to all of these works so um, the difference is not so much the story many of the stories existed already um, Coriolanus, for instance, is taken fairly much straight out of Plutarch. But um, what Shakespeare did in creating the psyche of the characters is really what set him apart. Oh, yeah. No, no, no doubt about it. And, you know, there, there was uh, even in Twelfth Night, you'll see mm. a lot of references to Freemasonic wisdom. You know, you might remember mm. in, in Twelfth Night where Malvolio uh, reads the letter and and it's the secret letter and it starts off with m o a i mm. right and that well, was actually the the last wife and four I just, letters just went over to opera house and saw um uh, magic flute uh, mozart mm -hmm. of course um i've seen it before but it's been quite a while which of course um, got mozart in quite a lot of trouble because uh really documents the whole stages of being initiated into um, a masonic uh, temple Absolutely. Absolutely. So I think there is, whether whether Shakespeare was one person or he mm. was a group of people, clearly there was Masonic influence in all of it. And, and we're finding that more and more. I'd love to uh, spend some time with you on that because I think you'll find the work fascinating. You know, there's a big, well, there's a I, big I wouldn't controversy. Say Masonic, I would say Masonic took over the ideas of the Enlightenment. And um, many of these sort of um, ideas of alchemy, etc., um, were the early ideas of science. If you look at um, Newton and others, uh, it, it's the same studies. And yeah, he these, was an alchemist yeah. for sure. Mm. I mean, eighty yeah. percent of his works were sold by uh, Cambridge University because they wanted mm. to disavow themselves of this, you know, body of work that that he would say was really him identifying the signature of the creator. The architect. Well, I mean, um, his theology and um, sort of uh, uh, looking into um, how to do alchemical processes was why he actually did mathematics. I mean, that's where people go wrong. They, they actually think he did mathematics um, as a scientist. Well, no, actually, he did it to describe everything <laughs> else he was doing. You're right. No, you're right. I, In fact, I don't know if you know this, but he was a, a huge student also of the Great Pyramid who analyzed the, the royal Egyptian cubit uh, and from it derived the Euler number. Mm -hmm. So the royal Egyptian cubit, which is pi over six meters, uh, turns out to be 1.718 feet. Mm -hmm. and, and he believed that when you add one more to that, that that defines the Euler number. And, mm -hmm. and so it was all from his studies of the Great Pyramid, which were disavowed by Cambridge University and Trinity College okay. because... They didn't want to associate with that. And, and mm. those, uh, the, that paperwork, a lot of it ended up in the hands of people like mm. Bill Gates Foundation, et cetera. But, 
but certainly there's a bigger story here that seems to connect. And I, I want to reference back to your comment about quadrivium mm. and education now moving more and more towards this notion of a roundedness. You know, mm. you're a polymath, right? And as mm -hmm. a polymath, you've had a very broad experience. You may, you may have Asperger's, but today I have not seen one aspect of that uh, Aspie re relationship. And whenever I've had conversations with you, they've been delightful and erudite and very, very um, informative. Well, you're focusing on areas I enjoy talking about. <laughs> well, yeah, okay. Well, maybe that's... <laughs> but, but, but truly, I think that when, when you get into your zone of you know, where you see the world is going and you keep mm -hmm. it on this big picture view, Mm -hmm. um, I think you are extremely enlightened in the way that you speak about things. And, and I found that to be every, mm -hmm. every time I've spoken with you, that's been the case. And so, but we've always been talking about very high minded topics mm -hmm. that are very broad topics as well. So this movement towards quadrivium, you know, I just wrote a book. Uh, my new book mm -hmm. is called polymath, right? I just finished this mm -hmm. book. And it's about this same notion of a well-rounded um, education. And, and, you know, my mm -hmm. first book was Philomath, which is, or Philomath, which means lover of learning. And mm -hmm. polymath just means many learnings. And so I, I have kind of gone around the world to try to find other people that I think believe this same way and have mm. well-roundedness. And what I found is that there's common denominators with these people. They tend to be very creative. They tend when they're very well rounded. They often speak mm. several languages. Um, they are they're entrepreneurial. They are able to access this field of information and can discover things new. Um, well, and, a, a and lot they, of um, uh, how you end up with different ideas is um, when you study cross fields. So you're not going to discover something you have no foundation in. And when you actually go across multiple areas, then it, it makes it more likely. So Bitcoin is really because I, I studied both computer science and economics and statistics and a few other areas and law. And um, you know, people who don't have those, those backgrounds sit there going uh, on about how wondrous it is, but not realizing that it's all things that all you do is tack together the existing building blocks. Well, when I read the white paper, and I'm glad you raised this topic, before I knew you, before I knew anything about you, I immediately read it and thought it was a polymath who wrote this. And I didn't know who it was. You know, I just believed mm. in the pseudonym, I guess. And I, but I, I did know one thing. I knew that it had to be a polymath because it was the convergence of all of those different, you know, mm. disciplines coming together in a somewhat of a simplistic solution, which I don't believe that the world's most complex problems find their solutions in greater complexity. Mm. I believe they find their solutions in, in incredibly beautiful simplicity. Mm. And as we said, you know, simplicity being the ultimate sophistication. And, and I believe that as Leonardo da Vinci also said, you know, to achieve a complete mind, study the art of science, study the mm. science of art, learn how to see, realize that everything connects to everything else. And I started mm. you know, looking at it also similarly and said, well, wait, you know, you think about mathematics, applied mathematics, you could argue is geometry. Applied geometry, you could argue is then physics. Applied physics, you could say, well, applied physics might actually be um, chemistry and applied chemistry could be biology and applied mm. biology could arguably become um, you know, uh, psychology and applied psychology becomes sociology and applied sociology becomes philosophy and applied mm -hmm. philosophy becomes mathematics again. Mm -hmm. And it basically turns into a circle. And, yep. and I think we are missing so many aspects of our educational rounding, right, in society that a return to a quadrivium is probably not a bad thing. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, as I said, um, um, I find it very interesting um, how some aspects of um, sort of U.S. schooling are moving back towards that. And in particular, it's, um, um, well, I mean, I have, um, um, I've, I've been collecting the Loeb Library for years and I've, I've about two thirds of the way through collecting all of them. Um, 
I don't have enough time to read all of them, so uh, I would collect much faster if I could actually read much faster, but I, I can't. Uh, but um, these works are remarkable. Just because they're 2,000 years old doesn't mean that they're not valuable. And um, uh, being able to, to learn how to read things in um, the native language is, is important as well. Um, I mean, that's an aspect of, of of all of this that I I, I sort of miss. I, I wish I could have the time to just sit down and and learn Greek. One day I might, but I don't have enough time for it now. But um, even oh, you know what, I'd, uh, I'd like to learn it with you, Craig. So maybe we could uh, do it at the same time because I I've learned eight languages in my mm -hmm. life, and I I speak uh, five of them fluently still mm -hmm. today. And the influence of Greek and Latin mm. on on most of these languages, because I also speak Chinese and Korean and Japanese mm -hmm. fluently. And oh, I, but, I bastardized them, uh, not Korean, but but Chinese. I mean, my accent's horrible. I still have a, a tutor, but uh, the tones. Yeah. Anyway, well, my, I, try. Uh, I, I can pick it up with other people. And, yeah, anyway. Australian is my ninth language. Uh, I did live in <laughs> Sydney. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, if you've lived in Australia, you know that there's that's not in, entirely ridiculous to say that because if you could say mm -hmm. some sentence like, you know, let's you know grab a slab, throw it in the back of my ute, go down the paddock and get pissed, mm -hmm. nobody here will understand what that means, right? No, I know. It's, a, it, it's definitely a dialect. It is. It's definitely a dialect. And... And you have to kind of learn, you know, words like fair dinkum, mm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, I remember the first time I heard fair dinkum, I'm like, what the heck is that? And I realized, wait a minute, dinkum is a Chinese word, which means gold. So in the gold rush, fair dinkum is like, is that real gold? Like mm. the real genuine article. So there's, mm -hmm. there's, there's a mix of other words into it as well that, uh, that I really enjoyed learning when I lived in Sydney. But, you know, I think this return to a quadrivium and polymathy uh, to, to help our students become more well-rounded and realize that everything is connected. There's a geometry at its base. I do agree with what you just said about an information-based universe. Mm. I fundamentally believe that. Are you following the latest research at, out of University of Portsmouth uh, that is attempting to uh, associate information as a state of matter? Mm. No, I'm not, actually, but... Um, it's pretty fascinating itself. stuff. Mm. So, I mean, we know that in physics, there is an equivalency between, mm. you know, implied equivalency between information, uh, mass, and energy, mm. right? Yes. Obviously. Uh, what they're doing is they're proving by colliding, of course, another collider, right? <laughs> another $5 billion collider or whatever. But they're proving that when you uh, collide a electron with its positron pair, mm that it will release a certain amount of energy and, and a gamma photon burst along with it, mm. and that there will be a differential displacement of information. Mm. And that that measured value of information can be directly correlated and then proven to mm -hmm. be exactly identical okay. in an inverse equation to energy itself, which mm. makes sense, makes total sense. And then it makes you question, well, wait a minute, mm. does that mean that, and it goes more towards a holographic universe, mm. I believe, uh, does that mean that the entire universe is really just another form of information and maybe all the manifestations mm -hmm. that we see of the universe, whether they be, you know, uh, solid, liquid, gas, et cetera, are all just emanations from the basic information. And maybe the coherence of that information is just what we call geometry. Mm. So information being the basis of the universe. So I do agree when you said that it kind of really triggered me in a positive way because that is also very much how I see it. But um, I, I, I believe that if we can return to a quadrivium at a basic form of education, and now, now I know that you want to pursue a PhD in education, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how would you go about changing the education system to bring it more in line with um, both interest from the youth perspective, mm -hmm. because you know we're living in a society well, where that's... people are interested in comic book movies. Well, number one, who cares? Um, it doesn't matter what the youth are interested in when they're that young. No child is going to sit there and go, oh, yes, I want to do this um, and I want to um, uh, read a bit of Plato today. I mean, <laughs> I'm sorry, but this is reality. 
Um, so like everything else, you sit there and you go, I'm sorry, Johnny. No, we don't want to talk about your mother now. We're doing math. And that's it. I'm sorry, you're doing math. Now do math. And you focus back on the topic. But and, well, as far as the yeah. curriculum goes, how would you change the curriculum so that it, it does become rounded like that? Or are oh, there fundamental I mean, changes um, we need to make? Yeah, I mean, it needs to go back into a, um, a combination um, that sort of works towards the highest end of what we can teach, not, not trying to dumb it down so that some people um, who, well, can't do something um, hold down the rest of society. Um, I'm sorry, but there's not going to be equality in this. And um, we should aim to basically impart the most knowledge and understand that we're not going to have people equal. Now, at the same time, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, we're going to have those people who end up plumbers and builders uh, beating up the eggheads of society and understanding that, yes, they have a point, but and they can do something I can't do, and I can do something they can't do, and the society goes on. So I understand also that you are teaching philosophy and that you're doing special kind of podcasts and you're becoming mm. uh, more active on Twitter, et cetera. Um, can you talk about these things a little bit? Uh, so yeah, later this month, um, I'll be on my 12th or 13th. Um, I think I injected another one, um, but, um, uh, philosophy lesson this, this time we're looking at the book of Job, um, which is actually, of course, part of the West, Western canon, um, um, starts and ends with prose, but, um, poetic verse in the middle. Um, but interestingly enough, um, like everything else around this time, you can also contrast it with some of the other Greco-Roman ideals. Um, for instance, one of the ones I, I want people to look at is um, um, a work that I've, I've had people look at before, which is um, Oedipus Rex, Oedipus, mm -hmm. uh, King Oedipus. Um, and if you think about it, um, uh, Job got everything back at the end. He lost his seven sons and his three daughters, um, but God gave him another seven sons and three daughters, which is arguably um, not equal because, well, going through loss is never going to um, fully be replaced with the same thing. But Oedipus there um, went through a lot, became king, and then in true form of Aristotelian tragedy was laid low, um, sort of gouging out his own eyes. And um, um, he married his mother. I mean, that's kind of, kind of a funny. Well, that that, that just sounds story. like a modern soap opera, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's it's an interesting story, though, I, and I love the way Sophocles takes us through it, mm. where you you almost think that you know they do certain things, right? Mm. His parents like you know, cast him out, hang him from a tree, right? And leave him there mm. to die because they're predicting or they, they have, you know, a, a soothsayer predictor mm. to tell them that this guy's going to come back and, and, you know, marry the mother and, and create, you know, this very shameful kind of circumstance and, and become the king. Mm. And no matter what they did, they couldn't change the destiny. Well, that goes into um, sort of, uh, some of the ideal, uh, some of the answers to grandfather paradoxes um, with time travel. Um, no matter what you do, you end up um, having the same thing happen. Yeah, so that what you did was actually part of the plan, right? Mm. But the changes that you tried to thwart the future you were trying to avoid actually, and as an unintended consequence, create mm. the future you were trying to avoid. Mm. Uh, and also, there's a nice little riddle of the Sphinx inside of uh, Oedipus mm. Rex as well. Uh, which I think is a is a fascinating part of that story. Mm. You know, it's the what walks on. Um, if I get this right, like two. What was it? Starts the day on two legs, uh, goes to four legs, and then ends up on three. No, no, it starts on four legs. Four legs moves to two, then goes back to three. That's right. Yeah, moves to two, then goes back to three. This is known as the riddle, the famous riddle of the Sphinx, mm. 
uh, that's that's embedded in that story. And Sophocles left us for that one. Um, and so you're teaching that. And then, of course, one of my favorites, the book of Job. Mm. Um, you know, the Bible, most people think that Jesus was the only perfect man. Uh, but actually, in the King James Version of the Bible, it actually says Job was a perfect man, mm. which is fascinating. Uh, Although he, there's the argument in, I think it's chapter 42 or 43, um, where Job and God have a bit of a communication. Um, and the argument there is, um, is Job actually prideful? I mean, I mean, it, it's not really what we would think. It's Job going, but I'm righteous. Why are you punishing me? But isn't that hubris and pride? I can't be punished because, well, I'm so righteous. And you're going up to God and going, well, God, what the hell are you punishing me for? I did everything right. Yeah, yeah. He, he had all the boils on his skin and everything. It's, a, mm. it's, a, it's quite a story. But So you teach these things. That's mm. an aspect of you I didn't even know. Um, I didn't even know that part of you. I didn't know that you were teaching these philosophical uh, mm. you know, wisdom teachings to people, and I, I applaud you for it. I think the society needs more of that today. And then uh, I know you've been very busy as well on um, your work in blockchain. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Oh, uh, so your recent work in blockchain. So uh, what we're we're trying to do is get rid of all the barriers to really scale, not not the um, small scale stuff like fifty hundred k, but into the millions and then billions of transactions a second. Um, and it's not as easy as people think. Everyone goes, <laughs> oh, you just make big blocks. Well, just making big blocks isn't a, um, an answer by itself. You have to disseminate those blocks, which means you have to send large amounts of data over networks very quickly. So you have to look at uh, ways of disseminating data over uh, multiple parallel channels without losing information. Um, so it, it, it's just not as easy as people go, oh, just make big blocks. Well, that would be fine if there was one central computer. And centralization the, is easy. That's the, I mean, that's the antithesis. Distributed, of what, yeah, it, yeah, distributed systems are actually the hard part. So when you're trying to um, distribute a terabyte around the internet globally in three to five seconds, when you can't even do that on your laptop, I mean, think about it. You can't copy a terabyte from your laptop to an external hard drive in three to five seconds. No, I'm going to that talking right about, now, in fact. Yeah, and we're talking about how do we do this around the internet globally? So it's not they're, easy. They're the, yeah, so they're the sorts of problems they're looking at. And all of my detractors sit there going, oh, it's easy. You're just sending files. <sighs> yes. Not so we're easy. We're just sending files. I mean, that's the, the simple way of looking at it. We are just sending files. We are sending goddamn big files. <laughs> a million times the size of your little files that you're trying to argue that you, know, you have problems with. And a million's a big number. Yeah, it is. <laughs> that's definitely a big number. Mm. Um, so what do you think the answer could, to this all could be? I mean, I think we need a, a, a more advanced compression um, so that we, well, can, no, no. we can get um, I, we don't it's not compressible anyway i mean the nature of the data um, but there are techniques in parallelization and um, um, indexing that we're using that will enable us to do it so uh, there are a couple um, hiccups every now and again uh, but that it just adds to the fun um, so i mean we're working on um, uh, as we parallels um, like add machines um, getting it like over the like 1.9 like every time you add a double the number of machines um, 1.9 times the amount of traffic is a good number um, that's harder than people think as well and um, it's not perfect but we're getting there well i'm going to share with you so you might recognize mm -hmm. this shape it's a cuboctahedron mm -hmm. And this was featured in the television show uh, Foundation. It was on Apple. It's mm -hmm. quite good. And it's a story that was written by Isaac Asimov uh, about mm -hmm. a civilization that was like, you know, way mm -hmm. in the distant past that figured out that was, they were going to be destroyed. Uh, Harry Sheldon at all. Yeah. Harry Sheldon, right. The mathematician who could predict the future based on mathematics. Mm -hmm. And 
And then, so what they did is they compressed all of their knowledge and wisdom into this one cuboctahedral shape, right? And then the whole story of the of the show of Harry mm -hmm. Sheldon's life is that, you know, they were creating a, a repository of information. So they had to compress it all through the geometry of this shape and other methods that we don't know. Oh, um, although part of the problem was um, um, being a psycho historian, he had to actually delve into find things in the past because if you consider 10,000 years from Earth now, the amount of history gathered not only from Earth, but multiple uh, uh, sort of solar systems in the story um, would be immense. And um, like people sit there thinking, oh, if we record everything, we'll know it all. And imagine going back through 10,000 years of history right now and trying to Google search something. I mean, right now we can actually Google search practically everything. But if you don't know what you're searching for, it's really immensely hard. Yeah. So if you want to know something about a particular emperor at a particular time, and really, what are you searching for to find that? Well, and what you're getting is also <laughs> to the victor goes the spoils, right? Mm. We don't have a a centralized repository of information that everyone can count on as being an objective truth, right? Because mm. that's the thing. The history books are written by the winners. Mm. Um, to an so, extent. I mean, there are a lot of, I mean, um, there's a lot more material than people realize that are written both by the, the victors, but also those who um, sort of had books that they had to hide. And uh, there are a lot more books that had to be hidden that, exist now than people seem to understand although we have a hell of a lot of lost history so what i would love to share with you at some stage is a new compression that we have developed that is purely mathematical and you could imagine that you know the entire universe could be built as metaverses are on right triangles um right triangles is the basis of inverse mm -hmm. square law mm -hmm. and and within these right triangles is you could have ratios that could mm. basically house an infinite amount of information mm. just in the ratios of the geometry. Mm. And so I felt patents on this and it's an exciting thing. And we've been able to take already compressed documents like fully maximum mm -hmm. compressions, which is basically taking out empty space and redundancy uh, like zip files, et cetera. And we can compress it um, at least another two to eight times very successfully and rapidly. So uh, I'd love to share that with you. Maybe it might have some uh, use potentially in, in blockchain and being able to transfer large amounts of data. But to take already fully compressed files and compress them, you know, that much more. And there's no theoretical limit. We can actually go much higher than that on our compressions. But, but we uh, right now, we, we, we know we can do it very rapidly based on uh, this sort of geometric approach and very efficiently uh, with, uh, you know, with what we're dealing with as of right mm -hmm. now. So, but it could go a million mm -hmm. times, right? There's no reason why. That's the beauty of geometry. Geometry can be infinite. So you're right. You can't compress files using the current compression methods, but there may be new mathematical approaches that I'd love to share with you at some stage that might mm -hmm. actually help us overcome those barriers. Mm -hmm. Ratio. Oh, res mirabilis. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it, it is It is just a different way of looking at it. And, you know, that may be why we have, if we have a universe based on information, then a universe based on geometry is probably what makes sense. Yeah, and that possibly. geometry can house within it between its ratios of two lines. You know, in, in trigonometry, it's not one and one equals two. It can also be one line plus mm. another line equals the third line, right, to mm. make a, a triangle. And, and, and inside that relationship, you could actually house an infinite amount of data within one yes, right yeah. triangle, mm. right? So now I know your mind is probably, because you're so damn smart, your mind is probably going shh, super fast because I know, I know how you're thinking, um, but, but certainly I'd love to share it with you. Mm. Yeah, happy to have a look. All right, my friend. Well, it's such a pleasure to talk with you. This was an incredibly delightful conversation on every level. And, um, and please well, and say hello to your lovely different wife. Things. I will do. We talked about all sorts of different things, that's for sure. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I really, really enjoy talking with you. And I look forward to coming and visit you when I next go to London as well. 
It sounds a plan. All right. Have a great day and all the best to you. How can people find you? Before we, we go, what's the best way for people to find you that want to learn more about you? Oh, look at my blog, uh, craigwright.net. Um, there are all sorts of topics. If I actually go over there and I, I mean, I, I publish about everything you can think of um, from Shakespeare to uh, Greco Roman history, legal things. Um, uh, today's post was um, looking at Victorian literature uh, from Wuthering Heights to the time machine. <laughs> So right on everything <laughs> from weathering heights to the time machine. Okay. Mm. Well, on that note, thank you so much, Craig, for taking the time with me. Such a pleasure. Say hi to your lovely wife and, and hope to see you again very soon. No problem. All the best. All right. <laughs> <laughs>